mind. And so I'm curious about that strategic angle also. Is that, is that something on your mind that more compute is the only way to succeed in AI? Yeah, I think more compute is one of the fundamental limiting blocks right now for a lot of things, uh, for a lot of domains. OpenAI is right now focused on, for example, natural language processing, uh, for example, with their most recent work on uh, GPT. So what they're doing there is uh, it's, it's a language modeling task where the neural network is generating language uh, text. And so you can get, uh, you can feed it text and it will continue text, or you can ask it to produce text with certain properties, or it will answer your questions, or it will talk to you. So what's happening there is the algorithms, again, in this setting are actually quite well known and understood. As you mentioned, the neural network takes the form of this transformer. You're training it in a very kind of standard regime with back propagation, stochastic gradient, and so on. So that's understood. So the algorithms are not the bottleneck for them. The data set is also not a bottleneck for that class of problems because we have the internet with a huge amount of text. So in that regime, also, you are not upper bounded by data sets, but you are upper bounded by the compute available to you, which really restricts the size of the model that you can actually use. And like I said, in deep learning, we are blessed with algorithms that seem to continue to work better and better as you just make them bigger. You're literally just adding neurons into the system and it works better. And so OpenAI is primarily gated by compute in this setting. If they could train a bigger network, it would work better. And that's not the way it used to be in AI. We used to be bottlenecked by algorithms. And so what a beautiful place to be if they could just run a bigger network, it would work much better and uh, the results would be even more magical. And is that true for Tesla also? Yes, I would say so. And neural networks have this property in general that, yeah, if you make them bigger, they will almost always work better. And, you know, in the limit, you can, for example, use, this is slightly more technical, but you could use model ensembles, you could use dropout and a lot of techniques to basically make sure that these models work better when you scale them up. And so we are also limited by compute to a large extent, and we have to be very creative in how we squeeze out all the juice from all the flops that we have available on the car. And so that's the case also on the car, but also during training uh, for us, right? So you want to train as big of a network as possible. And for us also, you have to consider the data set and to whatever extent that is a bottleneck and the algorithms and the models and to whatever extent that is a bottleneck. And so for us, for example, we do do a lot of manual labeling, but we are also looking into ways that you can train on data without having to label with a human. You can use sensors, expensive sensors, to annotate your data. Maybe you have a few cars to drive around with, say radars or lidars or any other sensing suite you want that gives you extra information about the scene, and that can function as annotation for computer vision. And so computer vision can be matching those sensors and imitating them. And so you have sensor annotation, human annotation, or self-annotation, like predicting the future. And so all of those are knobs and kind of algorithms you could play with. Now, Tesla is not the only company trying to build self-driving cars. There's other efforts out there. Sometimes, at least in the media, it's depicted as a bit of a race of who's going to get there first and so forth. And how do you see the Tesla effort different from the other efforts? It's a very good question because it is very different and it is not obvious. So, for example, there was a video just recently released where someone used a Waymo car and the Waymo drove them to some location, I forget the details, and then they used the Tesla Autopilot full self-driving beta build and it also drove them there with zero interventions. And so both cars took the same route and got to the same spot with zero interventions. And so to a third party observer just looking at this, these are cars, they take right turns, left turns, they navigate you to where you need to be, it looks the same. <laughs> but under the hood, the systems are actually extremely different, like quite different. So the approach of Waymo and many others in the industry, and I would say in the industry, you will see these two classes of approaches, really. And one is Waymo-like, and the other is Tesla-like, I guess in my naive sort of like description of it, I suppose. And in the Waymo-like approach, you are going to first outfit the car with many more sensors, in particular, the use of quite expensive LiDAR sensors that are on top. Uh, they give you range sensing around you. And you also have these high definition maps. So you need to drive around before you make the trip and you need to pre-map the environment in very high definition. And then when you are driving, you know exactly where you are on that map. So you know exactly how to stay on it and how to drive. And this is very different from what the Tesla car is doing because first of all, we do not have very expensive sensing. We just have a few cameras that give us surround view. And by the way, that's already a lot of information because each camera is say several megapixels. And so you're getting many millions of observations of what's around the car when each ray really is, is of brightness is telling you something about the world. 
So you're getting a huge amount of information from cameras that is very, very cheap and economical to produce. And we do not use high definition maps. So we have very low definition maps that are kind of like a Google map. So it's telling you that, hey, you should take a right turn, left turn, etc. But we do not know to a centimeter level accuracy where the curve is. Everything is coming from the system at that time through vision. And so the car is encountering these intersections and these areas for the first time, basically, as it's driving around. And it needs to look at the images and needs to decide, these are curbs, these are lane markings, this is how many lanes there are, this is where I should be to take a left turn. And so it's a much higher bar, much harder to design, but it's also much cheaper because the sensor suite is just cameras. And it's not specific to a location that you had to pre-map. So our system is very cheap and it will work anywhere. What this allows you to do then is that this affords you scale. So Waymo can have maybe a few hundred cars or something like that. We have millions of cars. And as I mentioned, scale is incredibly important to getting AI to work because everything is about data set curation. And so I do not see how you can fundamentally really get a system to work well in absence of, of scale. And so I think I would much rather give up some sensing in return for scale in AI problems. I'm kind of curious when, when you made your decision to go to Tesla, I mean, you must have seen that bifurcation. And was that something in your mind at the time that you thought about a lot about what you believe is going to be the way forward? Absolutely. I, I definitely saw the bifurcation. I felt like Tesla had the right approach fundamentally. And I'm a huge believer in deep neural networks and their power. And I think images provide you with a huge amount of information. And it's just a question of processing it in these deep neural networks that I know are capable of doing the processing that we need of them. And so to me, it's actually a brilliant strategic decision from Elon. I was absolutely on board with a vision only approach. And I do believe that the system can be arranged to process all that information and actually drive around. Have you ever had to sleep on a bench or a sofa in the Tesla headquarters like Elon? Uh, so yes, uh, well, I have slept at Tesla a few times, uh, even though I live very nearby, but there were definitely a few fires where that has happened. I found, I walked around the office and I was trying to find a nice place to find, and I found a little exercise studio. So there were a few yoga mats and I figured yoga mat is a great place. So I just uh, crashed there and it was great. And uh, I actually slept really well and could get a ride back into it in the morning. So it was actually a pretty pleasant experience. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. So it's not only Elon who sleeps at Tesla every now and then. Yeah, I think it, it's good for the soul. You want to be invested into the problem and you're just too caught up in it. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to travel. And I like being overtaken by problems sometimes when you're just so into it and you really want it to work and sleep is in the way. And you just need to get it over with so that you can get back into it. So it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, I actually do enjoy it. I, I, love the energy of the problem solving. I think it's good for the soul, yeah. So I'm curious, what, what's your view on the future of AI when we think beyond self-driving? What are the big things on, on the horizon for us? I think like, first of all, like, wow, the progress is incredibly fast. When you're zoomed into the day-to-day -day and the different papers that are coming out on the scale of a week, maybe sometimes it can feel slightly slow, but when you zoom out, like AlexNet, as I mentioned, this uh, this ImageNet recognition benchmark that was beaten by NeuralNet that really started the deep learning revolution and transformation was 2012. We're in 2021. So th it hasn't even been a decade. And I'll get to live hopefully four more decades or something like that maybe. Like from 2012 to now, has been a complete transformation of AI and a lot happened in a decade. And so if I'm going to witness something on those orders of magnitude in the next four years, it's really mind boggling to extrapolate. And fundamentally, we have these algorithms that seem to be only bounded by the data and the compute. We're going to get more compute and we are specializing all of our hardware to neural networks and all that is ongoing. Our current processes actually are not very specialized for running neural nets and there's a lot of long-term fruit there. And so, and also the size of the field has grown. And so there's a lot more brain power going into improving everything. And so there's this exponential like return on all this investment in hardware and software. And so you shouldn't expect linear improvements. You should actually expect like some kind of an exponential improvements. So it gets even more mind boggling. And so I think in the short term, we're absolutely going to see much more automation, be it self-driving cars or drones or warehouses. And that's very easy to predict. But I think on the long term, that's where it starts to get kind of even more dicey because I joined OpenAI. OpenAI is basically an AGI project, artificial general intelligence. So the idea is we're trying to develop uh, fundamentally a artificial brain that thinks and wants and acts and functions like a human being. So I would say 
next to a visual cortex, we sort of have a check mark, like that part of the brain, we sort of maybe like understand the principal stuff, but we certainly haven't understood the, the entire brain and how you know decision making is done and so on. But I think we are with robotics and so on, we are probably going to make a massive dent into that over the next decade or two or three. Yeah, I, I think we're probably going to see some very exciting things come from, from AI because the technology is not really upper bounded in any like real way. And it's mildly concerning, but kind of exciting. So I think we'll see what happens. Andre, it's been absolutely wonderful having you on. Learned so much. Like weights in neural net. It won't be C++ or Python or whatnot. And would you say at this point, when you talk about this neural net effectively being the program to build a self-driving car, is it just a neural net that's been trained with a lot of data or are there still other components? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in the car, there are both. Images enter in the beginning, right? And we have pixels of an image telling us fundamentally what's out there in the world. And then neural networks are doing some portion of the recognition. So they're telling you, hey, there's a stop sign, person, etc. But you can't just directly drive on person, stop sign, etc. You have to actually write some logic around how do you take those intermediate sort of representations and predictions and you want to avoid the pedestrian and you want to stop at the stop sign. And so there's still a lot of software 1.0 code sitting on top of the neural net. And uh, that code is basically reacting to the predictions uh, so that it speeds up, slows down, turns the wheel to stay in the lane line markings and so on. What I have seen in the history of the team since I joined them four years ago is that, and this is also why I think, is, is that really we've been porting a lot of the functionality from the software 1.0 land into the neural network. And so originally, the neural networks would only make predictions, for example, for a single image, and they would tell you, okay, there's a, there's a piece of a road edge. But we actually don't just have a single image, we have eight images, right? Uh, coming from eight different cameras that are surround in the vehicle. So every image independently predicts little pieces of road edges and curves, but there needs to be something above it that stitches it up into a three-dimensional sort of bird's eye view of what's happening around the vehicle. And that was all done in software developed by people. So you take road edges from here, you project them out, road edges from all the cameras, project them out, stitch them up across boundaries. And then over time, you need to also stitch them up and track them and make it sort of temporally continuous. And all that was written by people. And what we've done since then is the neural network has engulfed a lot of the pieces of the engineering. So the neural networks that are in the car today will not make a prediction per image. They will make prediction directly in the bird's eye view. So they will say, okay, I've seen these eight images. And from that, I can see that the road edges are this way around the car. And also I've seen the images over time and I've done the tracking and having accumulated information from all those frames, here's actually what the world looks like around you. Pieces of the software 1.0 code are being engulfed by the neural net and it's taking on more and more responsibility in the stack. And maybe at the end of the day, this can all just be a neural net. So maybe there's a very little room for engineering. Um, maybe the images just come in and what comes out is just what you really want, which is the steering and the acceleration. Easily said, hard to do, but that is the final conclusion, I would say, of, of this kind of a transition. And there's very little software written by people. It's just a neural net does the whole thing. Yeah, that's the holy grail, I would say. We are dropping new interviews every week, so subscribe to The Robot Brains on whichever platform you listen to your podcasts. Oh, and feel free to drop us a review and share our episodes with anyone you think would like to learn more about AI, robotics, and the people bringing them into the real world. Now, when people think about neural nets, often part of the reaction is, at least in, in the early days, was it's hard to understand what they're doing. And, and here you are putting a neural net as part of the decision-making system for driving people, which is, of course, I mean, a very um, risky thing if the autopilot makes mistakes, right? So how do you build confidence in the system? I imagine you have early rollouts sometimes in, in your own cart. How do you decide you're willing to, to try it out? Maybe directly engineered code is in, is in charge of a lot of the, the stack. But I think it gives a false sense of understanding of the entire system, because ultimately this can be hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So yes, you can analyze individual functions, but this is a very complex dynamical system. And I think you may have a false impression that you actually understand the system, even though you understand like the individual components. I would say really what it comes down to is you want a very robust process for uh, really testing the whole and subjecting it to a huge amount of evaluation, maybe both in 
for all the individual components, making sure that, okay, the detection itself works and all the little pieces of the neural network individually by themselves, but then also end-to-end -end integration tests. And you just want to, to test the system. And you want to do this whether or not the neural app is in charge and you want to subject it to, say, a huge amount of simulation to make sure it's working as expected. And also, of course, through driving. And so we have a large QA team that uh, drives uh, the car, you know, verifies that everything is working you know, as well as possible. And so we have a number of mechanisms by which we test these systems. Another one that's big for us is uh, shadow mode releases. So you can deploy the functionality, but it's not wired up to control. It's just making predictions, but it's not actually like acting. It's there just uh, silently observing and making predictions. And then uh, we sort of test it out without it actually driving the car. And so in some cases, you can also do that. So to me, this is just basically the idea that we understood the previous software is false. And fundamentally, you just need extremely good evaluation. In those evaluations, I'm curious, has ever any of the testers or you experienced something they're really surprised by? And like, wow, this car is smarter than I thought. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically every time it drives me around in the latest uh, also driving beta builds and just the emergent properties of how it handles different uh, situations, like if there's a bicyclist in an oncoming vehicle, and if you program it properly and the neural network works very well, they'll get these emergent behaviors where it does the right thing. So I would say like every drive, <laughs> I have maybe a few of those. I gotta imagine you still hold your hand to the steering wheel and you put on the brake pedal just, just in case. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the current system is the full self-driving beta build that I drive around every day. And uh, it's actually quite capable. I think people sort of understand that the autopilot is, you know, it works quite well on the highway and a lot of people use it and it can keep a lane on the highway. But the latest builds that we have in the full self-driving package are quite competent, even off highway and safe streets. So I was driven to get a coffee this morning and back to my house, a 20 minute drive around Palo Alto and it was zero intervention drive. And this is a relatively routine for us. So it's not a perfect system, but it's, it's really getting there. And I definitely keep my hands on the wheel because uh, you know, we will still do not very clever things once in a while. And so there's definitely more work to be done. Now, of course, whenever it makes a mistake, in some sense, that's that's high value, assuming the person takes over correctly, of course, because that gives you the most valuable data, the, the missing pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, that's right. So interventions are, are a very helpful source of data for us. And, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of other ways that we can also get data that where the network is misbehaving. Uh, a lot of disagreements, for example, with the human driver, like we think there's a stop sign, we should be stopping, but the person just went. We can look at a lot of that data